Shalom. Welcome to the Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon of the Chabad House of Dalmar, and together with my co-host, Mark Kronich of Statewide News Services and JavisTechValley.com, and now the new columnist for the Jewish Press. Right. I have a column called The Albany Beat, and I talk about how government relates to the Jewish community, or doesn't, as the case may be. So uh, this has been uh, a rewarding uh, assignment that I've been uh, that I've added to my portfolio. So a great success. And uh, today we have a wonderful, wonderful guest with us. I see her around the Capitol for so many years. Uh, we have Karen Scharf. Uh, there aren't that many Jews who are lobbying and are involved in the Jew in the uh, Capitol. So you know you're now, why is you're that, one Mark? of the few people have said that. I mean, a lot of the government. A lot officials. of them are behind the scenes and doing the, the work uh, behind the scenes, but they're not out front advocating, and you know, there's just no reason, it's just the way it is, but Karen, <coughs> welcome to The Jewish View. Thank right. you, good to be here. And, uh, you, and you live in New Baltimore. Yep. And how long have you been around the Capitol? Have you been? Um, well, I've been running Citizen Action of New York since 1984. Um, but in the earlier years of that, I wasn't doing that much lo direct lobbying myself. So I've probably been around the Capitol more since around 1990-ish. Now, I should say, you're executive director of uh, Citizen Action of New York. Yep. And that's not to be confused with Citizen Action nationally or anywhere else, because the, there used to be a cit national Citizen right. Action. Right. There's now, it's now, there's now a, our, the national group that we're affiliated with is now U.S. Action, right. which is in 20-something states. Right, and now, but we kept Citizen Action of New York yes. here, and they exist on their, in their own entity. Right, that's right, we're a statewide group. Well, yeah. I mean, just it's so ambiguous, Citizen Action, just to find what, who you are, what you are, what you're advocating for. Sure, so Citizen Action of New York is a statewide organization. We're a grassroots group. We've got members, 20,000 members across the state, organized in eight regional chapters. Um, so right here in the Capital District, we've got a Capital District chapter, Western New York, Elmar, um, uh, Southern, uh, Tier. Southern Tier, um, Metro Justice covers our work in the Rochester area. They're our Rochester affiliate. We have a Hudson Valley um, organization, New York City, and Long Island Progressive Coalition is our Long Island affiliate. Um, and so each of those areas, we organize people to take action on local, state, and federal issues with a focus on economic, racial, social, and environmental justice. And our goal is to part is on the one hand to empower people to speak on their own behalf and to be active and to make their government responsive um, to them and to their communities, and at the same time to work for a more just community and a more just New York and a more just country. And it's safe to say uh, that you're a liberal organization. You mainly gravitate yeah. towards liberal-oriented issues. Yeah, we're definitely on the progressive side of the spectrum. We um, believe strongly well, in... conservatives you know, could be progressive in a different direction. I guess. It depends on how you define progressive, that's I guess. Exactly, but to me, pro for me, progressive <laughs> means that we want a just society, and we want to, which means you know, fairness and opportunity for all of us. Um, Maybe you should define a few major issues. I mean, we're in 2015. Right. Issues that you're dealing with that you feel that there's major wrong in society or sure. maybe because you're up in Albany in government mm -hmm. that needs to be corrected. I mean, our biggest areas that we're working on right now this year are um, raising the minimum wage. We think that everybody needs to, everybody de deserves to earn a living wage, be able to support their family. Living and wage, which so, is important. Right, and we think the minimum wage should be raised to a living wage level. So right now we're very much part of the fight for 15 an hour. Right. Um, you know, the governor just announced the calling of a wage board to look at the wages of fast food workers, and we hope to see those fast food worker wages go to 15 an hour and then take it from there to have a statewide minimum wage that goes up to 15 an hour. And I've so, always asked at the news conferences when they say raise the minimum wage, I said, well, why not call it a living wage? Because if you say a minimum wage raised to ten dollars an hour or nine dollars an hour, it's it not. doesn't do you. Right. As we say in Yiddish, a race go off in a gel. <laughs> you know, you're, you're throwing. Well, please translate it. We're you're gonna throwing out money. You, you know, right, you're throwing right. money out. So. Yeah, that's why we really moved away from just raise the minimum wage to the fight for fifteen. Because we good. feel like fifteen is a minimum level where people. It's still in a, some parts of the state not enough to support a family, but at least it begins to get that's there. Sure we think that's really that, important. I mean, I've heard, I don't have a position either, just to, but I'm a rabbi, so I like yeah. debating <laughs> over here like a Talmudic <laughs> uh, person. But it just say a lot of these are not family, they're just kids, you know, working at a fast food mm -hmm. and, you know, $10 an hour, whatever they're getting now, 8 and 10, I don't even know what it is. Yeah, they're getting 8 You know, good now. enough, uh, you know, for a kid, teenager, 16 year old mm -hmm. teenager, good enough. and. You know, you're going to make them 15, then you're hurting the the business community. So it's 875 right now. Most of the what we've found as we've started to do the organizing, what we have found across the country in this campaign is that most fast food workers um, are supporting their families, um, 
and a lot of them are single moms, um, and a lot of them are adults, and a lot of them are people that have worked in the same, sometimes in the same store, but definitely in the same industry for decades. And yet they're still earning, you know, either 875 or maybe they've gotten up to nine or 10. Um, but, you know, that's still 18, not enough. 18,000 a year. Yeah, 18,000 a year is not yeah. gonna even feed yourself, forget your kids. And what the, go the governor brought attention to last week when he announced the wage board is that New York State taxpayers are subsidizing these companies. So McDonald's is making its billions in profits. We're providing food stamps and other social services um, to all of their workers because they're making such low poverty wages. And so they're operating on a business model where their employees can only survive by being dependent on taxpayer funded services. So in a sense, the taxpayers are helping McDonald's make their billions in profits because they, don't, they want to take that money for profit rather than paying their workers. So we feel that workers deserve a just raise, that they deserve their fair share of that company's um, income, and that it doesn't, it's not fair for uh, taxpayers to have to subsidize McDonald's and the other big corporations that are very profitable. Um, and they can afford to pay 15 an hour and still make money, mm -hmm. and so that's what they should be doing. So we're very active at Citizen Action in the fight for 15 in terms of organizing workers and nationally, but also at the state legislature in pushing for them to raise the statewide minimum wage. And, and you know what's interesting is that I've seen the minimum wage go up over the mm -hmm. years, and the same cry has been going on, oh, it's going to bankrupt us, it's going right. to break us. You know, the mom and pop hardware store, the mom and pop pharmacy, whatever. But they're also going to say, uh, they're also going to grow into it. Mm -hmm. You know, all these businesses, as the cost of living uh, increases and, and as more medicines come on the market or the economy expands and there's, you know, more revenue to go around, you know, that minimum wage or living wage, you know, then becomes a norm and mm -hmm. all these businesses all of a sudden grow into that, right. that dollar amount. Right. Because and who, who would have ever, I mean, I'm probably older than you, but you know, when, when you look back at the old TV shows, uh -huh. and you know, let me put it that way, and you see that the, what the cost of certain things is, right. oh, here's a nickel, right, right. or it's here's a dime, yeah. and you say, wow, that was then? You know, but back in the 60s, if you said something was a quarter, you're like, oh my goodness, I can't, I don't have that. Right. You know, it really meant the, So but two, two really it. interesting points yeah. in what you're saying. One is just that, yes, the, most economists agree as they look at what's happened with minimum wage increases across the country, even as some cities like Seattle and Oakland are going to 15, is that it doesn't actually hurt business and it doesn't hurt the local economy. It improves the local economy because people have more money to spend. They spend it. It helps businesses grow. And so the general experience of raising the minimum wage has been positive for not just the workers, but for the overall community and the economy and the local businesses. But the second thing that's interesting what you're saying is sort of changes over time. Because what we've seen is that the uh, minimum wage and wages in general um, have not kept up with the size of the economy, the growth of the economy, and the cost of living. And so the minimum wage now is worth way less than it was you know, going back to the 60s or 70s. Yeah. And there's been a, it's, it's important to think about because it it's not by accident that this is happening. We've had a real change in economic policy in our country really since Ronald Reagan in 1980. There's been a, there's a shift. Up until then, you saw a pattern where basically as the economy grew, workers' wages grew, and inequality, there was always inequality, right. and it's always also worse for people of color than for everyone else. But right. even with that, there wasn't the huge gaps we're seeing now where the wealth is so concentrated and the power is so concentrated with that. And what we've seen with the you know, advent of trickle-down economics is that it didn't trickle down, and wealth has gotten more and more concentrated at the top, and income has gotten more and more concentrated at the top, while everybody else has seen their wages and their income grow less and less. And so we're seeing this huge divergence with the top going way up and the bottom just kind of creeping along. And that huge inequality has made our economy um, not mm -hmm. thrive for mm -hmm. most people in the, in the United States because we have a situation where not only are we not earning enough, but then we also can't spend enough mm -hmm. um, to keep businesses going. So we don't have the situation anymore we used to have where, you know, the, the famous stories about Ford Motor Company where Henry Ford was like, I have to pay my workers enough that they can buy my products. Businesses aren't thinking that way anymore. And now that we're in a global economy with this different kind of philosophy and the level of power that's been concentrated politically, um, we, we have an economy that's worse and worse for the ordinary working person, and not just minimum wage workers, but really you know, the 99% of people who are not the wealthiest. And it's, we see it in income, but we also see it in just ownership and wealth. How much of the assets do people have? How much of the wealth of the country is going into a few small hands? Let me just change that. What, what's your background? What brought you to this point where you're wired <laughs> for all this and, okay. and you got to this area where you're so well versed in mm -hmm. so many different topics? Um, I really, uh, you know, I 
grew up in the um, 60s and 70s, and so I think was really influenced by the political movements of that time. Um, Where the did you first grow up? Uh, grew up in Westchester, New York. Okay. Um, and my first real political event was in 1970, just after the Kent State killings. I was in middle school, and you know, it was just a shock to me as a 13-year-old that mm -hmm. college students could be shot for protesting. <laughs> it's like something that just seemed completely impossible, and you saw that happen, and it just really, it was transformational. Um, and it was the first political protest I ever went to was the next day at, at our middle school. Um, and I wasn't that politically active at that, you know, even at, through high school at the time, but it was just, you couldn't escape, but, you know, being involved but somewhat in the protest, because it was a, that was a watershed moment, mm -hmm. and the kind of years that followed that in high school, while I wasn't that political a person, I was part of, you know, what was happening in the country at that time, and couldn't, you know, was very aware of the, the, the movements that mm -hmm. were happening, civil rights and anti-war. Um, and when I got to college, which was then more of the late 70s, um, it, was, it was less of that was, you know, that was sort of past that era in a lot of ways. Um, Where did you go to college? I went to Harvard. And it was active at As the time. What did you graduate with? I uh, got, got, got a BA in so social studies. Social studies, yes. okay. And I went to Harvard thinking I was going to be a scientist. I started out as a biochemistry major. Um, but I really got more politicized while I was in college. I did a lot of um, just volunteer work in the community mm -hmm. and saw a lot more of the okay. fact that the sort of charitable volunteer work we were doing wasn't really changing anything and really felt like something deeper was needed, that there needed, people needed to be empowered to speak for themselves and we needed more of an organizing approach and so, as I volunteered for different groups, I kind of got educated to what the different models were of political work and organizing and got introduced to a group called, at that time, Massachusetts Fair Share, which was the equivalent of Citizen Action of New York, oh, really? basically. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. exist anymore, but at that time it was there. And they were organizing in all the neighborhoods throughout Boston, kind of across income lines and across racial lines to try to create a majority of people coming together around a shared economic interest. Wow. Well, it's so, interesting what, Mark, what you were saying, that the lobbyists aren't too Jewish, but really it's a... I don't know if typical Jewish story because huh. Jewish people generally are interested in like social justice yeah. and caring about uh, you know the mm -hmm. downtrodden. If but you I'm, want to, I'm say just thinking like. of the administrators at Harvard. They probably didn't like you very much because <laughs> you know, they, they yeah. like everything to go smoothly, go along, get along. You know, they're very blue blood. You right. Know, so. I was more active off campus than on campus, but you know, I was there was a group, there's an entity at Harvard called the Phillips Brooks House Association, which yeah. I was involved with, which basically had helped students find volunteer work in the community. And that's really where I was more focused outside of campus. So they didn't much notice. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what, did you go for a master's? Or? I didn't. I, uh, I didn't I either, so oh, I just see, I, you know. I left school really wanting to be a community organizer. Um, <laughs> I went to South Carolina for a year to work for the Brown Lung Association, which was organizing cotton mill workers who were getting sick at work. I remember that. Yeah. Um, as a young Jewish woman, I was very out of place in South Carolina. Right. Um, it was kind of people, I definitely was in a place for the first time in my life where people had never met somebody Jewish. And really? people would just say to me like, wait, you mean you don't believe in Jesus? Like I, they just was a foreign concept to them that it was actually possible to not be Christian. So it was it definitely eye-opening. Um, and I learned a lot about organizing and learned a lot about just what it's, how different you know, South Carolina you was from New York. There you go. The there you go. Um, and then from there, I went to be an organizer in Citizen Action in Connecticut, and kind of have been with the Citizen Action, move, you know, right. the U.S. Action Movement since then. Um, came to New York in 1983. Back to New York. It was good to come back home to New York again. I know you felt more at home. <laughs> so it, was, it, was good to, it was definitely good to be back in New York. So you also said education was right. one of the big policies. So in addition to minimum wage, we work a lot on yeah. education issues. That's so something that's been a big you, issue for us for quite a few years now. The education investment tax credit, mm -hmm. which is a big issue with the capital, is you've taken a position on that at all? Um, we're opposed to it. Why? Um, we're opposed to it because think, we feel like public dollars need to be focused on public education. And parents can make their own choices. People can do whatever they want in terms of their kids' education. That's you know every parent, every parent's right. But in terms of public dollars, our public schools are grossly underfunded. Um, we still have not met the requirements of the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit, which required the state, based on our state constitution, to adequately fund our schools. We're still not doing it. So I don't feel that we can afford to spend money on non-public schools when our public schools are but not getting resources. But this is a tax sources. credit. It's not spending. It's not writing a check. Right. To but we have to. We, we bear the taxpayers bear the cost of that tax credit. So if I give you a tax credit that's worth a million dollars, that's a million dollars out of the state treasury. That's and that, not going to the state that, treasury. It's the, it otherwise would. Current right now it is. But as soon as I give you that credit, I won't be collecting it from you anymore. And the way that this tax credit's been designed is it can be contributions of up to a million dollars. So some of these super rich guys from New York City can give their million dollar contributions, get a $900,000 tax credit. Like, that seems crazy you, to me. But you know, I'm, again, Bethlehem, it's a nice suburb, of course. 
and they were just saying how Bethlehem is doing well because the average New York state child is uh -huh. costing twenty thousand. They're saying, "Ooh, we're eighteen thousand, right. whatever." Twenty thousand dollars. You know, it just struck me that's not even be political, man. Twenty thousand dollars for twenty-five kids. You have a half a million dollars per classroom. You know, classroom. I mean, why isn't that enough? You know, I'm just. You know, to me, that's an incredible amount of money you're spending on a, every child. Why aren't they getting a good education after that? Well, in Bethlehem, they are getting a good education. Yeah. So I think it's yeah. money well spent there. And some, some districts are not. And I think what, what, what the lawsuit found is that in districts where there's heavy concentrations of low-income kids, which what we have in, in New York and in a lot of the country, but it's very extreme in New York, is because of housing segregation by income, well, heavily by race as well, but especially by income, school districts are, are often are either very poor um, or you know, sort of middle class or rich. And there's not a lot of um, income mixture within school districts. So we have school districts in the state who have as much as 70, 80, and 90 percent of their students on free lunch because there's such poverty within their school district. And when you have a school district that has to, everyone, all of the research shows that it's more expensive to educate poor kids because they come with less and greater needs and less ability, you know, less um, preparation. And so the cost of educating poor kids is much higher because they need more intensive attention, smaller class sizes, more remedial work, other kinds of supports that, that are not available at home um, to kids that are not poor. And so those school districts, once you have a concentration of poor kids in a school district, it becomes even more expensive because the challenges are so heightened. So if you have a classroom of 25 kids, all of whom come from middle class homes, come to kindergarten knowing how to read, have parents at home that can help them with whatever comes up in school, that's one thing. If you have a classroom of 25 kids who have no, not only have no help at home, but some people are not going to a home, some people are going to a home where nobody's home, it's some people are going to a home where there's violence or, or starvation or other other kinds of really extreme circumstances, that's a very entirely different classroom to be able to cope with as one teacher with 25 kids, and it, it doesn't work. So there's a lot. You need smaller classes. You need social workers. You need special help. You need all kinds of other things in those classes. And you also need things like after school, before school, things where kids have a safe place to be and stay. And that's what, um, what the Campaign for Fiscal Equity lawsuit was all about, is that the school districts that have these greatest needs are not getting the adequate resources because of the segregation and because our schools are financed so heavily on property taxes where poor districts have less money even though they need more money. So we look at these averages and we say things like, you know, the average school, the average per pupil expenditure in New York is so high compared to the rest of the country, but those averages hide a lot of disparity. We have the biggest difference in the country between the per pupil spending with our wealthiest districts and our poorest districts, over $8,000 difference per kid. And then when you do that same math per classroom, that's a huge difference per classroom. The averages are Something like, uh, yeah. you know, you know, an average doesn't mean that everybody's getting that's right. twenty thousand. Exactly. I know what you're when you talk so about I want to go. I want to go back to the EITC mm -hmm. because it picks up on what you just said. Is that the uh, if the if someone had a million dollars and they got a nine hundred thousand dollar credit, you were saying something mm -hmm. about that. If that million didn't just go for a school downstate, let's say and it went to a needy school in Albany or Rochester, private school, mm -hmm. you know, yeshiva, mm -hmm. you know, would that appease you? Would there be other, um, would there be other amendments that you'd like to see? Maybe a lower limit, maybe not the million. Is there some way of compromising that you could still get, a, get over the fact that it's not, pu it's public money going for private, you know, uses because we do, uh, fund and we do give money for private colleges, mm -hmm. the uh, Kiku, you know. Mm -hmm. has, has, right. So I was just wondering if. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I, I do think it's made worse by the fact that it's structured to favor the biggest, wealthiest donors and to give them a tax break that they don't need. But I will say that just even if that weren't the case in general, I, I'm a strong believer that the public money is for public goods and that we should be funding public institutions, especially because we don't adequately fund them. But even if we did, I think that that's the purpose of public of government is to fund public services. Okay. Um, so I'm not a believer in government funding private services. So you're not in favor of the, of the government funding private colleges? You know, I don't know enough about the specifics, but okay. in, in general concept, I think our money, similarly, I think our money should for college should go to SUNY and, and to community uh, colleges, yeah. but all of which could use, our, you know, we have a great public college system in New York State, right. and it's underfunded too. And, you know, community college and SUNY tuition costs are going up. And, you know, it used to be that CUNY was free. It's not anymore. 
um, and SUNY tuition goes up every year, and those are things that, you know, if, if we have dollars available to pay for higher education, let's put it into the public institutions. That's what the taxpayer so, money's for. So is there any, because they're working on compromising yes, it right. and all that, is there anything that you could see happening that would still, where you could still Not that I would favor, no. Not that I would favor. just hold your nose <laughs> no, and just no. say no. <laughs> no, I think we, you know, look, the thing is with, um, state budgets and state spending and tax credits is very much, even though we don't write a check, it's spending because it's, it's foregone revenue that could go to something. Um, I think it's, it has to be very focused on our highest priorities as a state. And our highest but priorities the, as a but state. But the governor says that it's just not money to cure what needs to be cured in the public education system. It's not all about money because we give more money. I mean, our state education budget is larger than most state budgets. It's big. We have, a, we have 2.7, 2.8 million public school students, and a lot of them need a lot of attention and are poor. And, we, okay, and, and the court determined, you know, court objective process that we're underfunding our schools. We're not meeting our constitutional obligation to fund our underfunding, schools. Underfunding, because yes. it's still not all about the money. It's not. No, money is necessary, but not sufficient in logic terms. Like, you have to have enough money to provide a good education, and then you have to spend it well, and you have to have, you know, good supports, good accountability. Like, we are strong supporters. When we worked hard to get the new state funding formula. After the campaign for fiscal equity court decision came down, um, we were fighting hard to make sure that that meant a foundation funding formula that was fair with accountability. And that's what was passed in Elliot Spitzer's first year as governor. He passed a new foundation funding formula that met the court requirements, that had a four-year phase in, and that had serious accountability measures for the districts that were getting that money. Um, and the first year funding went out, the second year mostly went out as well, and we started to see those improvements. The accountability measures were actually working. Then we hit the fiscal crisis in the state, and the money got frozen and then got caught. And so we, and we still have not, we've now begun to catch up a little bit with the past few years. And we hit our ethical years. crisis at the Capitol Yes, and then too. we hit our ethical crisis, which is the other thing we work on. As you know, yesterday I was out there talking about the need to uh, deal with the issues of corruption at our Capitol. And well, that's one thing The thing that's, that's so too. deep about this is that the issues of corruption and of economic justice are completely intertwined, yeah. in my view, because I was talking before about the concentration of wealth and of power, and what we see is as wealth has been more concentrated, so is political power. And right now we have a state government where so much of the decisions are shaped by who gives money, both in the campaign finance system and in all these other ways we're now learning about as the U.S. Attorney does his investigation. Well, you must have read the complaint that Preet Bharara had mm -hmm. against Dean Scalos. Yep. Could you just tell me where you see, if you see, where Dean uh, enriched himself? So I'm not fully versed on the details of the complaint, okay. but I think it's not so much about in personal, I mean, his son got enriched, so that seems that's, to be, that's what the complaint says. But any father would do that for any son. I mean, it's... But he, does he have a right to use the power that, we, that he has as a state official to enrich his son? That's the question. Is it? And I don't I think mean, he does. But did they get any state contract? Did he as a state official? It looks like, it looks like he passed laws to their benefit. He, you know, passed laws that were to the benefit well, of the real estate pass, industry. Sing, singularly passed. He has laws. a huge amount of power. That's the thing. Right, but he, but the, he gave. And these guys, but, it wasn't singularly because these guys gave to the assembly, they gave to the senate, and they gave to, to the everyone. governor. They made sure that everybody was going to do Covered. what they wanted. So yeah. that's the thing. Like they so it's have literally Dean. bought. No, it's not just Dean. They have so, uh, Shelley Silver is also under indictment for similar, not the same exact things, but, but similar Leonard patterns. Leonard Litwin is the connector with all of this. Right. I mean, Leonard Litwin. Glenwood management Glen and the Glenwood real estate management. industry more broadly, because it's not just him, has really escalated. Well, and it's, they've done this for a long time, well, but it's did, really yeah. escalated in the past few years. Well, what did, but you know, the, the contract that Abtec got was for Nassau County. Right. It didn't have anything to do with the state. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there were multiple things. There was the Abtec contract, there was the title insurance money, there was various ways that he was driving, allegedly but, but driving not, income. But keeping it away from the state but, the, but but he so did he, that by promising state policy in return. But, We're about to act on your self-interest in the legislature. I'm going to give you the legislation that you want if you take care of my son. But isn't that, but I'm not saying that's the way it's always done, and uh -huh. I'm not saying that, but you can say I can attempt to give you the legislation that you want. I can't guarantee that yeah. it's going to go through. He delivered. He got them what they wanted. But he might not have. Yeah, they, they had a risk there. There was a okay. risk factor, but they probably wouldn't have kept doing it if he hadn't delivered, right? But I'm just saying, you know, this has been, I'm, I'm just, I'm not sure where this leap is from making that direct connection to saying, okay, you know, did, for example, his Dean's son, Adam, mm -hmm. 
did he give his father some of the money that he got? I don't and think I it don't matters, think so. actually. I don't, th I don't think so, but I don't think it matters, because it wasn't <clears throat> a lot of corruption in our state. I mean, some of the corruption that we've seen has been about p personal enrichment. And, you know, that's the corruption we understand the most easily. Like, like Bill Scarborough. You, you know, you handed me money, right. like, or, or I stole money, out. or whatever. Right. Like, that's the most simple form of corruption. But that's actually, as a... Um, voter and citizen in New York, citizen of New York State, that actually bothers me less than the corruption that has to do with public policy. Because someone got rich or richer because they were corrupt, they stole money, they took money that wasn't theirs. That's bad. People should go to jail for those things. But that has much less of an impact on New Yorkers than if a, the corruption involves passing legislation that hurts ordinary New Yorkers and is at the expense of ordinary New Yorkers to benefit a few wealthy contributors or other or actors in other ways. And that's what bothers me the most as somebody who believes in democracy and fights for democracy and fights for everybody to have an equal say in our democracy is that we don't. We have a government where we don't have a real democracy. The voters don't really control what happens with public policy because our top leaders are more likely to do what their donors or other people who have other ways of giving them, you know, mm -hmm. payback in one way or another. They're more likely to do what they want than what millions of voters want. And it's like we see that in the education stuff. They would rather do what a few wealthy hedge fund contributors want them to do than what 2.7 million public school students need. And it's not because it's better for the state of New York. It's because there's a payback for them as you know, government officials for delivering for these wealthy well, donors. As an example, I remember the Channel One controversy. Remember the Channel One no. controversy? They wanted, to have, they wanted to have Channel One uh, in all the schools, oh, right. and it would be programming that the kids would have to see, but they would have advertising. Right. And then they said, uh, in with the uh, programming, and they would say, well, you, what are you going to advertising for soda, and advertising for McDonald's, <laughs> and advertising for this, and then that would have paid, but it would have been putting. Uh, it w wasn't anything healthy for the students. Right. So there was this whole controversy that killed the whole idea yeah, in the state. Yeah, I mean, that's state, the thing so. is we're supposed to have a government that works in the interests of the majority of people. Now, you know, there can be conflicting interests and there can be fights and people can have different views of what's best. Mm -hmm. But we want to at least have everybody working toward what they believe is best for the people who put them in office, yeah. for you, their constituents. You, you articulate it very well. And <laughs> I just never heard it articulicated that well from anyone that I've talk, <laughs> spoken to. So I got to compliment you. On thank that you. Because and, I mean, thank you. And I think there's 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 a um, there's more and more um, good evidence in this. Like I'll cite somebody else who articulates it very well. So Demos, which is a national think tank that does a lot of great research on these issues, has published a series of studies nationally, not just New York, but they have New York examples <coughs> about. Um, they've researched like what do wealthy people want in public policy, and what do the majority of people want in public policy, and then what are the public policies that get enacted. And they've found that, not surprisingly, as we are talking about right now, that what we see is the public policies that wealthy people want getting enacted, because they are the ones that have the greatest influence over our state and federal <coughs> government. And government is supposed to represent the majority, and it's not right now. Right now we have a government that's not representing the majority. It's representing a small group of people who have the most political power. And, and you know what's interesting is that when you talk about, like, we had Disability Awareness Day, mm -hmm. and when you talk about these bills that get passed for the people who don't have a whole lot of money, they make a big public <laughs> right. th thing right. about it. Right. But when the donors and the big money people get something passed, like the 421A right. or whatever, that's like quiet. quiet. We don't put out a release on that's that. That's right. You know it's saying? all very... But the yeah, ones right. that we say, oh, look at what we did for the small people or for the people who right. are not as able. <laughs> oh, now there's a big press release, a big conference, big banners, yep. you know. Yeah, you know, that's very they, true. They, it's they, so true. <laughs> they want to show that they're at least trying to go to bat for the people who can't go to bat for themselves yep. at some point. You know. No, that's definitely, that's but right. But I always said, you know, they, they did this limit where they said, you know, oh, you can't take someone out to eat at a right, restaurant. Right, right, right. I'm like, if you can get bribed for a meal, <laughs> you come cheap. <laughs> I said, this is ridiculous, you know. That you, <laughs> right. And, and it, all it did was hurt the restaurants in downtown yeah, Albany. Yeah, it didn't change anything. It didn't change anything. I mean, that's worse, the thing is that but, we, is they, we keep having these reforms that, are bit meant to sound good, but don't change anything. Like ethics, all yeah, the it's ethics the eth all the different each each phase of ethics reforms hasn't changed anything. These like limits on you know lobbyist meals hasn't changed anything, and we have these series of reforms where we're told that we're cleaning up our state government, and yet nothing changes. And that's because they're not willing to do, or they haven't right. been willing. I mean, the assembly's actually been willing, and the governor's been willing. The Senate Republicans have not been willing to change the status quo and do and change the core of the campaign finance system or so that it's not dependent yeah. on 
big donors. Or status Cuomo, as we say. Yes, status, but, right. Or quid pro Cuomo. <laughs> right, okay? we right. Do, there's we all that. We have those, too. Yes, but anyhow, those. I wanted to... I mean, we uh, support this um, you know, small donor matching system where we have publicly funded yeah. elections. You make it, New York City has this, Connecticut has this, other states have it. You make a small donation, it gets matched with public funds, so people can run and win with small donations from their district only. Because then you're accountable to the voters right. instead of being accountable to the donors, and then you represent the people you're supposed to represent. So let me ask you this last question in the minute we have have left. Uh, what do you think of John Flanagan as the Senate Majority Leader? Um, I think it was. It's good to have change. Um, I hope he'll be different. I hope that we'll have a different kind of Senate. But it, there's not a lot of signs for that. He's gotten contrib contributions from the same, you know, pe Glenwood management and the same crew of people that Dean Scala has got his contributions from. Um, so I worry that the state Senate. And he's quickly announced today he's not planning to do any more. Reforms. Yesterday, he, he immediately said, announced, yeah. you know, I'm against any change. Yeah. I asked so him that, that was, question. That was and a good I question. I said to him, and I said, well, when? And he said, last week, which meant that he already resigned from the law firm last week, figuring he's going to get. That's interesting. You know, and, I mean, it's good he resigned from the law firm. It's good he's trying to, yeah. you know, limit his conflicts of interest. But again, unless he's willing to change the rules that they all operate by, well, we're going to have it. lots of the. We have a bigger problem with legal bribery than illegal bribery, quite honestly. And unless they change the rules, we're going to still have that legal bribery we get through the campaign finance system, where now that he's the leader, he's going to have all of the wealthy special interests in the state coming to him, saying, I'm going to contribute to your campaign committee for the Senate Republicans for 2016 if I get what I want. And now he's going to have those exact same conflicts of interest that Dean Skelos had, unless he's willing to change the rules. And that's what we need to see, is a and, change in the rules. And you know what David Patterson said? He said, when I was a Senate minority leader, I had $15,000 in my campaign coffers. When I became governor, I had $3.2 million yep. overnight. That's exactly and right. And he was like, now what do I do with all this money? Because people just gave him because of his title, that's not right. because of who he is. They yeah, can, no, know. and you see that when the, if you look at the campaign giving, when the control of the Senate went from the Republicans to the Democrats and then back to the Republicans, the same exact donors gave big to the Republicans, right. then they gave big to the Democrats, then they gave big to the Republicans, because they don't care. Right. Their job is to just make sure that the government has been paid by them to do what they want. That's and true. that's, you know, that has to change. That's what has to fundamentally change. And they give to the major part, the majority party, more, but they'll also give to the minority party. Right, just to cover. A little bit, <laughs> just in case they become the majority party. They could say, yes, we gave you a little bit less, but we still gave you. All right, Mark, it's very interesting. We're out of time. It's very, very interesting, Karen, and that giving our viewers a good lesson on how government works. And good success that you're sticking up for the good people of New York State and continued success and do it with good health. Yes. Thank you. Much success. Continue. Thank you very much.